The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome again to Pastor Yeshua. In part one of this episode, we began to take a look at the central claim and the cornerstone to Christianity. We pointed out that even outside of Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is an issue for which the answer for every man, woman, and child bears eternal consequences. Since the stakes are so high, each person owes it to themselves to carefully examine and weigh the evidence before making a conclusion. We began by identifying 12 presumptive facts regarding the investigation and exploration of Jesus' resurrection. In part 1, we discussed the presumptive fact that Jesus was crucified and Jesus died. In part two, we address the fact that Jesus' body was placed in a known, accessible tomb, that Jesus' disciples were scattered abroad after Jesus' crucifixion, that the tomb where Jesus was buried was empty three days after his death, and that a large number of his disciples, both separately and together, said that they saw, touched, and ate together with Jesus after his death. In part two and three, we began to see how each of Jesus' disciples were psychologically transformed after his resurrection. In parts four through seven, we began to ask what theory best fits all of the twelve presumptive facts. So far, we have examined 11 of 17 theories and or allegations which generally represent the typical theories posed throughout history to explain Jesus' resurrection. The theories examined so far were 1. The disciples stole Jesus' body and preached Jesus as having raised from the dead. 2. The Jewish leaders took Jesus' body. 3. The Roman authorities took Jesus' body. 4. 
the women went to the wrong tomb. 5. Jesus resuscitated after having swooned and came forth. 6. The disciples had hallucinations. 7. The disciples made up the whole story. They were telling lies, and they knew they were telling lies. 8. The gardener removed Jesus' body, i.e. the lettuce theory. 9. Jesus had a twin brother. 10. Jesus' body decayed before Sunday and thus disappeared, i.e. the rapid decay theory. And finally, 11. Jesus was a Zen or yoga master. He learned how to simulate death, practiced it on Lazarus, and finally performed it on himself. So far, the theories presented have still failed to provide an effective explanation and have been found to be logically deficient. In this episode, we continue examining the remaining theories posited. Theory number 12, the Passover plot. The Passover plot is a theory posited by a British supposed biblical scholar, Hugh J. Schoenfield, in a book published in 1965 entitled, quote, The Passover Plot, unquote. He also published a translation of the New Testament, which conveniently supported some of his work. In the book, Schoenfield believes that Jesus became erroneously convinced that he was the Messiah and plotted, based upon his knowledge of the Old Testament, to fulfill every prophecy given therein so as to claim the office and title of the Messiah. Further, Jesus plotted and arranged his arrest, trial, beating, and crucifixion. Apparently, the plan was for someone to drug Jesus so as to give the appearance of death, and then later, one of his accomplices could extricate him or his body from the tomb, and then Jesus or his followers could claim that he had resurrected. Unfortunately, Jesus' plan was foiled when the Roman soldier pierced Jesus' side, which ultimately killed him before the rest of his plan unfolded. Nonetheless, Jesus got a break when several people mistook someone else for Jesus, who they wrongly believed had risen from the dead. The mistaken story spread, and here we are. This theory, like the other 16 theories, consciously or unconsciously stipulates to the truthful premise of the following facts. A. Jesus was a historical person. B. Jesus was crucified. C. Jesus died. D. Jesus' body was placed in a known, accessible tomb. And finally, E. The tomb where Jesus was buried was empty three days after his death. So first we see again that Jesus was a historical person. If this were not the fact, then there would be no Jesus to plot anything. This theory does not fly unless Jesus was crucified, otherwise he could not claim to be the Messiah that he wanted to be since this was a requirement of Old Testament prophecy. Likewise, this theory starts out with the idea that Jesus was going to make it only appear that he died, but concedes that he did die ostensibly as an unforeseen accident. In order for this theory to fly, it would be necessary to combat any who might claim that Jesus had not risen and that the story was made up. Thus, it would be vital to have a known accessible tomb so that any skeptic could readily verify for themselves. Likewise, the tomb where Jesus was buried had to be empty. Otherwise, any claim that Jesus had risen would be short-lived as soon as someone discovered that the tomb where he lay was still occupied by his corpse. Thus, all five of these presumptive facts must exist as a factual basis for the above excuse to even be lodged as a potential valid explanation. As we continue our examination of this theory, we encounter the following problems. A. 
If we are being intellectually honest, we begin to see that Schoenfield and any others who hold this view possess a priori bias. To suggest that anyone would be able to orchestrate the place of one's birth, the timing of that birth, their lineage, and numerous other specific details of one's life at an age where one has no knowledge or control of such issues depicts the utter intellectual anemia which one must be suffering from in order to avoid the blatantly obvious fact that these prophecies were fulfilled because Jesus was the Messiah by nature and office. B. This theory fails to explain how Jesus could hope to plan the details of his arrest, six trials, beating almost to death, sentencing, and crucifixion sufficient to achieve his goal of surviving all of it to then be awakened from his drug-induced appearance of death to reappear as the risen Lord. On the one hand, we are expected to believe that he planned a series of events which would rival a three-dimensional chess game played out in his imagination beforehand, while at the same time we are to believe that such a master planner was somehow unable to foresee a Roman soldier piercing his side and killing him. Either it was all very predictable, which was how Jesus pulled off fulfilling prophecy in 99% of his crucifixion, or it was a volatile, fluid situation that no human could totally foresee. But you cannot have it both ways. C. In order to allow for the possibility that someone removed Jesus' body from the tomb and left it empty, this theory denies that there was any guard upon the tomb in contradiction to the historical narrative. Yet, even the Jewish religious authorities, who would have been enemies to the Christian narrative, are said to have bribed the guard and instructed them to say that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body. D. This theory claims that an unidentified person was mistaken for Jesus. If there was such a person, then surely they were alive and well after the time when Jesus supposedly ascended to heaven. If they were, then that person's persistent presence would tend to disprove any claims that Jesus had ascended. Thus, as soon as the Jews or the Romans found this person, they would be sure to make a public show of this person in Jerusalem to destroy the disciples' claims. E. The disciples lived, ate, saw, heard, and worked with Jesus for over three years. After the resurrection, the disciples and others claimed more than a one-time chance encounter. They described eating with touching, seeing, and hearing Jesus repeatedly who interacted with the disciples and identified himself repeatedly, including displaying crucifixion wounds over 40 days. Thus, the chances that 11 disciples and others who intimately knew Jesus would confuse him for some unknown person are virtually non-existent. F. This theory requires that one or more of the disciples would be complicit in Jesus' plot to identify himself as Messiah. Consequently, if this is the case, it would be impossible to justify the kind of psychological transformation experienced by those involved disciples for the remainder of their lives despite persecution, suffering, torture, and death. G. This theory fails to explain how a hardened Pharisee such as Paul, who persecuted the church, would be motivated to become Christianity's greatest spokesman and advocate based upon a plot that failed. Instead, Paul claimed to have encountered and saw the risen Jesus at a time when the real Jesus would have been dead according to this theory.
In all, when evaluating the allegation and or the theory of the Passover plot, we find that this explanation provides very little, if any, credibility which would be necessary to initiate the birth of the Christian faith. This theory would provide little potential to explain, maintain, much less grow the Christian church. In conclusion, this theory is highly inadequate to explain and justify Jesus' resurrection and the phenomena of his church. Because of this theory's inconsistencies and insufficiencies, this theory fails to provide an effective explanation and is therefore logically deficient. Theory number 13. Joseph of Arimathea removed Jesus' body. This theory, like the other 16 theories, consciously or unconsciously stipulates to the truthful premise of the following presumptive facts. A. Jesus was a historical person. B. Jesus was crucified. C. Jesus died. D. Jesus' body was placed in a known, accessible tomb. And finally, E, the tomb where Jesus was buried, was empty three days after his death. If Jesus was not a historical person, then there would be no body to remove if Jesus did not exist. Further, if Jesus had not been crucified and died, there would have been no body to remove. Likewise, it would be impossible for Joseph of Arimathea to remove Jesus' body if he did not know where his body was. Lastly, making the allegation that Joseph of Arimathea or anyone else removed Jesus' body would be pretty hollow if Jesus' tomb was still occupied by his corpse. Thus, all five of these presumptive facts must exist as a factual basis for the above excuse to even be lodged as a potential valid explanation. Before continuing, we need to briefly discuss who Joseph of Arimathea was. Matthew chapter 27 verse 57 reports Joseph was a wealthy friend and disciple of Jesus. John chapter 19 verse 38 reports Joseph, quote, was a disciple but secretly for fear of the Jews, unquote. According to Luke chapter 23 verses 50 and 51, Joseph was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin who did not consent to the council's condemnation of Jesus. Finally, upon Jesus' death upon the cross, Matthew chapter 27, verse 58 states that Joseph went to Pilate, requested and was granted Jesus' body, whereupon he and Nicodemus buried Jesus inside the tomb. This raises the obvious and necessary question of who was Nicodemus? According to John the Apostle, Nicodemus was a wealthy Pharisee on the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. The first time Nicodemus is mentioned, he comes to see Jesus at night shortly after the cleansing of the temple and inquires about the signs which Jesus performed in Jerusalem during the Passover feast. Jesus then converses with Nicodemus about the need of being quote-unquote born again or quote-unquote born from above to see the kingdom of God. Later, Nicodemus advises his colleagues among the chief priests and the Pharisees to hear and investigate before making a judgment concerning Jesus. Finally, Nicodemus donated a mixture between 75 to 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes with which to bury Jesus. Now, I will grant you that the majority of the above information detailing Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus comes from the Bible. However, even if we assume a bias against the Bible as a reliable source of information, we are still left with only two possible options regarding these two characters. One, either Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were two very staunch Jewish believers who remained faithful to the Jewish religious establishment in Jerusalem, or they were both followers, friends, and faithful believers, albeit somewhat secretly, of Jesus'. 
With this brief overview of their backgrounds, as we continue our examination of the theory that Joseph of Arimathea removed Jesus' body, we encounter the following problems. A. Given the politics of their day between the Jewish religious establishment and the Roman authorities, both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had everything to lose, and the only thing that they had to gain from supporting Jesus would be one of two things. 1. Jesus was mistakenly believed to be someone who intended to set up a kingdom immediately and conquer the Romans. Based upon this, one or both hoped or expected to have a place of leadership and power in that kingdom. If so, then Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus both had to be very disappointed when Jesus was arrested, tried, beaten, crucified, and died. 2. Both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but would have understood that as a result, any reward which would come would come much later in the life to come after the final judgment. B. If either Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus were ultimately only loyal to the Jewish establishment, then it would have been doubtful that they would have been involved with the burial of a man that the Jewish religious establishment viewed as being a criminal and a blasphemer. Secondly, if their first and only allegiance was the strict adherence to Jewish laws and customs, then given the fact that the Sabbath was at hand, no self-respecting Jew would want to make themselves ritually unclean by the handling of a dead body, unless that dead body was someone very important and or close to them. Lastly, it must be asked why Joseph would want to place the dead body of a criminal and a blasphemer into a tomb which many believed to have been his tomb, thus making his expensive tomb now unusable to himself by the presence of an unclean dead body. The only answer is that if it was Joseph's tomb, then Jesus would have had to be someone very close to him indeed. C. Both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus likely knew all too well that Jesus had alluded to rising from the dead. If either Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus were ultimately only loyal to the Jewish establishment, then they would never have done anything with Jesus' body which would have undermined the status quo of their Jewish positions. If we assume that the only reason they buried Jesus was out of a sense of common decency, then the moment that the word began spreading and preaching began that Jesus had resurrected, one or both would have been highly motivated to disprove such lies by recovering Jesus' body, which they had supposedly moved. To fail to do so would have undermined the faith which they found their position, honor, and authority. D. If for some reason Joseph of Arimathea and or Nicodemus were ultimately only loyal to the Jewish establishment, we have to ask what motive could they have which would motivate them to move Jesus' body? If for some reason they wanted to undermine all that they were loyal to, they would still have to get past the guard which would have been placed uh, over the tomb, they would still have to break the seal and roll back the 2,000 plus pound stone uphill to access the interior. They would then have to access Jesus' body and move it along with the 75 to 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes which it was encased in. They would then have to remove the body, place it somewhere where no one would ever find it. They would both have to know that given all these circumstances that their mission would be almost impossible and the likelihood for getting caught was almost certain. The punishment would be very costly and severe. People don't undertake these kinds of risks for causes that they are enemy to. E. Finally, if Joseph of Arimathea and or Nicodemus moved Jesus' body, 
then under this theory we would have to assume that they lived the rest of their lives without saying or doing anything to contradict the ever-growing movement of Christianity based upon the lie which they had made possible. They would have had front row seats as they watched numerous once pious Jews such as Paul and others forsake Judaism for the lie that they knew to be Christianity. They would have to bear the ultimate responsibility for creating a religion which would have violated the first and foremost commandment to have no other God beside Jehovah. F. If, on the other hand, either Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus were ultimately loyal to Jesus, then we must assume the reason they moved Jesus' body from its original location was either to spite the Jewish religious establishment and or Rome, or to make the general population believe wrongly that Jesus had risen again. Under these circumstances, they would still face all of the obstacles and risks mentioned above. They would have to be 100% successful in obtaining and disposing of Jesus' body so as to make it appear that he had risen again. In doing so, they would have watched their positions and prestige they had enjoyed within Judaism evaporate proportionally while having nothing to show for it. G. If Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus moved Jesus' body, they either told the disciples who then became complicit in the fraud, or they kept the movement of Jesus' body secret only to themselves. If the disciples became complicit in the fraud, then we now have to explain how knowledge of Jesus' fraudulent resurrection would provide any motivation for the total psychological transformation which is historically evident with every disciple for the remainder of their lives despite trials, persecution, arrest, torture, and death. If Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus kept the movement secret, we have to ask why would they stand by for the remainder of their lives saying and doing nothing while the disciples and countless other fellow believers were living under the delusion of a lie and being persecuted, arrested, tried, beaten, tortured, and killed. Neither suggestion is beholden to the decent, honorable, and God-fearing men who they were recorded to be. Instead, they both would have to be the worst kind of immoral, dishonorable monsters. H. The theory that Joseph of Arimathea and or Nicodemus moved Jesus' body fails to explain how that others would later claim to have personally seen, touched, and eaten with the resurrected Jesus. Even removing the disciples as conspirators, we still need to account for the reported hundreds of others who saw Jesus, as well as Paul, who would have doubtlessly, as a Pharisee, known both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. In all, when evaluating the allegation and or theory that Joseph of Arimathea and or Nicodemus removed Jesus' body, we find that this explanation provides very little, if any, credibility which would be necessary to initiate the birth of the Christian faith. This theory would provide little potential to maintain, much less grow, the Christian church. In conclusion, this theory is highly inadequate to explain and justify Jesus' resurrection and the phenomena of his church. Because of this theory's inconsistencies and insufficiencies, this theory fails to provide an effective explanation and is therefore logically deficient. This concludes this episode. Please join me again for part 9 of this series. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. The world falls
Trust in. I will trust in. I will trust in.